Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Manitoba Agriculture Crop Talk webinar. If you have any questions during the presentation today, please type them into the question section of the GoToWebinar menu, and we will answer them at the end of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded, and you will receive a link to the recording. Thank you. Thanks, Lori. Uh, I'd like to welcome everybody to the uh, August 17th edition of Crop Talk, and today uh, we are uh, are going to be talking a little bit about uh, getting back into seeding and we're going to talk a little bit about uh, winter wheat and I maybe forgot to mention fall rye but we'll touch on fall rye as well as maybe triticale but uh, uh, anyways uh, we're lucky to have Alex Griffiths uh, he's uh, an agrologist with Ducks Unlimited Canada and spends a lot of his time working with uh, winter crops and uh, thought it'd be a good opportunity for him to maybe uh, talk a little bit about how the crop did this past year and uh, maybe what's uh, what's happening uh, new for this coming fall and uh, maybe some uh, new uh, new advantages to growing winter wheat. So uh, that'll be uh, uh, our first presentation today. And then after that, uh, uh, we'll, uh, we'll go into the crop scouting panel and there might be a couple of questions for there uh, as we go through. So uh, I guess, uh, I'm going to save my part of my presentation till after Alex, uh, so we'll switch over to Alex right now and get him going on uh, winter uh, winter wheat and uh, some of the winter cereals. Thanks, Lionel. Can you hear me and see my screen? You bet. Perfect. I'll get going then. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Alex Griffiths, an agrologist with Ducks Unlimited, and I'll be presenting on the 2022 winter wheat season and planning for 2023 here. So today I'll start with a recap on 2022, as many things happened from last fall till now. Then I'll get you prepped for planting this fall with variety selection, seeding info, and fertility. I'll end with a brief section on all winter cereals and why they can be a part of your rotation. So going back to this winter, as many may recall, it was snow heavy, which is great for insulating the crowns of winter wheat, the left picture shows four inches of light fluffy snow, which is an ideal amount to buffer the low air temperature through the coldest months of December to March. On the right side, though, is a picture my parents sent from my or from their farm by uh, Clear Lake on April 14th with 32 inches of snow on the tape there. And that didn't melt completely until the second week of May, which would slow winter cereal growth tremendously and cause a whole suite of other headaches just moving it around. With that much snow, we saw something uncommon that was seen in multiple multiple fields this past spring in snow mold. Snow mold is what you see when you have brown patches in your lawn following the winter. It likes dark, humid conditions around zero degrees for rapid growth and large, lush, healthy plants in the fall that can touch the adjacent rows to help the disease spread from plant to plant. In most years, warm, sunny, dry weather is enough to promote rapid plant growth, helping stop the disease development. This past year was a perfect storm of conditions for snow mold though. Uh, the early harvest meant early seeding and the dry year had leftover nutrients available for the crop so it was well fertilized. Plus it was a wide open fall with most places not freezing up until late October. As a result, there were lush, healthy, large plants going into winter where we had excess snowfall and all the snowfalls in April gave sustained periods of ideal conditions for the disease to thrive. Overall, I saw two fields severely affected and completely reseeded, while other fields showed symptoms but were able to grow out of it. Heavy clay soil seemed worse off as the melted snow stayed on the field a longer, extending disease development. It was an anomaly and frustrating to see because the growers it affected did everything right to establish the crop but were dragged down by a warm, long, warm fall and too much snow in April. So if you are concerned about your field, Assessing winter survival is an important and often, often difficult decision. I like plants per square foot where 25 to 30 plus plants is ideal and right where the yield plateaus. Uh, 13 plus is still about 90% of your expected yield and seven to eight green and growing plants is around the amount where fields get reseeded. Yet if left to grow, that can still surprise with its exceptional ability to tiller and is about 80% of expected yield. The table on the left there is from 1999, so it is outdated as the maximum yield of the newer varieties should be about 80 to 100 bushels per acre if weather cooperates. 
To illustrate that point a bit further, here are some pictures from Crop Diagnostic School in Carmen this year. They had seeded spring wheat at rates from 45 plants per square foot to three plants per square foot. The average winter wheat seeding rate targets 33 plants per square foot. So after a good winter, an ideal plant stand has the field looking like the one on the left, which is 27 plants per square foot and has 100% of its yield potential. The picture on the right is nine plants per square foot and would be about 80% of the field's yield potential and would usually be reseeded. But for only having one third of the plants, I actually think the picture on the right does not look horrible. Plus when you get an excess moisture year, such as this year, where it is hard to get every acre seeded, having a winter wheat stand like the one on the right would really surprise most people with how it rebounds and yields. For example of that, this is a field of gold rush I scouted near Dothan this spring. On May 16th, when I came to check it, there was snow mold damage coupled with some regular old winter kilt. Thankfully, the snow mold damage was mild as these crowns still had energy to feed plant growth, but were stunted for a slow start. Nine times out of 10, a field looking like that by the third week of May would be reseeded. But with the wet spring, we had this, this producer had not yet seeded an acre yet. Uh, as a result, he left the field to recover, and a couple months later, you wouldn't believe that it was the same field. They were pretty ecstatic to see what they thought was a complete write-off turn into a pretty nice looking crop. Only trouble with this field uh, will be harvest timing though, as some of those more bare spots will take longer to fill those extra tillers. But all things considered, this was still pretty impressive. And for a different perspective, here's a picture from the sky showing the extent of the damage by July there. The red circle is where I had taken the ground photos from. And from the air, it is easy to see that less than 5% of the field was affected. My guess is the bare patches is where the snow in April had drifted and piled up and just helped spread the disease that way. So the reason that winter wheat can still put on bushels at such low plant stands is its ability to tiller. It takes up bare space in the field very well, which is good because winter kill, as you saw in that last slide, is rarely uniform. These were two plants that I pulled from that same field, and the one on the right was in a perfect uniform plant stand around 25 plants per square foot, while the one on the left was one of two plants per square foot. The left plant had 12 tillers, all with these massive wheat heads, compared to the uniform stand having three tillers and smaller heads. And while it is great to see these poorer areas still produce, the right side is where you really want to be. Staging for pre-harvest timing will become a challenge, as all those tillers will take time to fill, but it is certainly better than being completely bare. Plus, these areas are usually limited to your typical winter spot, winter kill spots in headlands, hilltops, and your low areas. So getting past the early spring and into the summer months, since seeding was so delayed, it took priority and lots of herbicide applications were done late or not at all. Thankfully, a winter cereal starts early and can outcompete many annual weeds. So while not ideal, if you have to skip an in-crop herbicide, it's probably the best crop to do so in. With the wet weather also came a boom in disease pressure. Nearly every field I scouted had visible tan spot and I've never seen so many fungicide applications with herbicide or at flag leaf than I have this year. I'm actually a big fan of uh, something like propiconazole or tilt at flag leaf timing, as in wheat, the majority of your yield is coming from the flag and the penultimate leaves. So the longer that they can stay green and healthy, the more bushels the plant can put on. Uh, here's a field near Nipua on June 23rd, right around the end of the boot stage as some ons were just starting to show. It was a really healthy, uh, nice big plants and definitely worth protecting with a fungicide at head timing for fusarium. The earliest fusarium head blight risk map was on June 27th this year, and nearly the entire province was at high to extreme risk. Warm plus 25 degree weather and humid conditions favored disease development. And the end of June might have been the first warm week we got <laughs> to start the summer. Uh, then here's a picture of fusarium head blight with premature bleaching of the wheat spike and a light whitish pink mold, which leads to the tombstone kernels that you see in the sample. For more info and much better pictures of plant and seed, the Mantobag Plant Diseases online catalog is full of great resources. Just for interest's sake, when making this presentation, I pulled some similar info from last year's presentation. 
on the same day as our previous slides pictures were taken on June 23rd, I was visiting our plots at the Carberry CMCDC and they had already been sprayed at head timing and were already past 50% flower. The Fusarium head blight risk map started on June 19th and shows low risk for nearly the entire province. Crazy how the cool wet start really did put all crops a good 10 days to two weeks behind schedule, even the crops that were already in the ground. Also a stark difference between a hot dry spring and a cool wet one just a year apart. Post flowering winter wheat was pretty regular and just hoping for no hail, except where there were high densities of grasshoppers. Uh, here was some pictures of grasshopper damage on a field near Melita, with the picture on the left being a shed cuticle of a two-strike grasshopper, and there were dozens of these in the field. Just an important consideration if uh, in a bad grasshopper area and planning to sow any winter cereals this fall, there are a few options to avoid having your crop negatively affected. Doubling the seeding rate of the outside round or two is my personal favorite, as it allows the crop to be seeded early while still combating the insect pressure. You can also wait to seed towards the end of the recommended seed window when pest pressure is reduced. And lastly, if you notice extreme damage in the seedlings, you can reseed those areas after the first killing frost, as grasshoppers will have significantly declined by then. Uh, a little late for this in winter cereals, as lots of harvest has already started, but I can't stress enough how important it is. Make sure before spraying to check the greenest parts of the field past the thumbnail test and are less than 30% seed moisture. This keeps the crop saleable in all markets. Also take note if these areas are green because of weeds or because of tillers. If it's weeds and the wheat in those areas pass the thumbnail test, then spray away. But if it's green because of tillers, those are likely higher yielding areas and worth waiting for or harvesting separately. So that's a quick wrap of what I saw in 2022 and now on to planning for seeding this fall. Variety selection. Wildfire is an excellent option and one of my top two favorite varieties for Manitoba. It has the best yield potential currently on the market. In Alberta, under irrigation, it has reached yields of 130 plus bushels per acre. So I think that on good, well, dry land conditions with good weather, you could probably get 90 to 100 bushels. That wouldn't be out of the question. It is rated very good for winter hardiness and it is moderately resistant to fusarium head blight. The biggest knock on wildfire is it is susceptible to stem rust, but a preventative fungicide application usually takes care of that. And I actually haven't seen any stem rust in winter wheat the last two years. Um, it's also a later maturing variety. It's about three to four days later than Emerson, and it's very recognizable by the bronze colored heads as seen in this picture. The next variety I wanna talk about is Gold Rush, which is on par with Wildfire as an excellent option in my opinion. It has the best winter hardiness I've seen in the varieties available currently. At the Parkland Crop Diversification Foundation in Roblin, there was some winter kill on our third rep and all varieties bounced back very well, but Gold Rush didn't have to bounce back because it survived it originally. On top of that, it has good yields and a higher protein grain. The only knock on Gold Rush is it is rated intermediate for Fusarium head blight resistance, while every other variety right now is at least moderately resistant. If you're looking for a good yielding variety that can survive a tough Manitoba winter, Wildfire or Gold Rush are your best options currently. There is good seed supply of Wildfire. Gold Rush supply is a little bit tighter and might require an order from Western Manitoba or Saskatchewan. And just to show what I was talking about there, this is a picture from PCDF where the third rep showed winter kill damage. On the left is Emerson, Gold Rush is in the center and Network is on the right. Gold Rush hardly showed any winter kill at all, which is great for yield and competing with any weed flushes. I also love moments like this where something that you were trying to avoid like winter kill ends up providing tons of value in the knowledge you gain. Next is Emerson and it's the old standard in the province. It is fusarium head blight resistant, which no other wheat variety can say, and that makes it a great reduced disease pressure or a lower input option. If grown for feed, its low vomitoxin levels are very desirable in a hog ration as well. It has good winter hardiness, and I was actually surprised to see how well it turned out on some peace double fields this year. I personally think it doesn't quite yield like the newer varieties, but I still like it and fully understand why it is so popular. Finding seed regardless of location in the province should be quite easy. Uh, Network is a newer variety that is quite popular in Alberta. 
it was bred to be a gateway replacement that is very short and has very high protein, and it's also moderately resistant to fusarium. Gateway is rated fair for winter hardiness, and network is rated good, so there is improvement on the winter hardiness side as well. But network is still the least winter hardy variety that I'll be talking about today. Alberta likes it because the straw is so short and strong that it can handle high winds in wide open prairie without logging issues. An interesting finding of network this year was that all the diversification centers, we saw the upper leaves start to curl and look spotty brown. Turns out it was physiological leaf spot, which can often be misdiagnosed as tan spot or septoria, but unlike either of those, it cannot be helped with fungicide. Physiological leaf spot is favored by cool, wet springs, followed by summer conditions that promote rapid growth. So it is not surprising to see it this year. And we actually never saw it last year in any of our trials, which it was a warm, dry spring in 2021. About two weeks post flowering, it was mostly recovered, but there were still remnants of the damage, such as the completely brown and curled up flag leaf in the bottom left corner, which was at PCDF on July 14th this year. Long story long, network is more susceptible to physiological leaf spot, which occurs in cool wet years. And I'm very interested to see how it yields in our plots before recommending this on a field scale planting for Manitoba. Vortex is a newer variety that is currently at the select stage or step two of five before certified seed. Uh, Vortex was bred to be an Emerson replacement and has improved traits across the board with better yield, protein, winter hardiness, and disease resistance. It is also moderately resistant to fusarium and shorter, so lodging is not an issue. We had Vortex and Wildfire in our nitrogen fertility trial this year, so it will be interesting to see how that turns out. There's no seed available until the fall of next year or 2023 to my knowledge, but it looks quite promising and I think it'll be a very good variety going forward. Another variety that is even newer and I'm really excited to see more of is Cold Front. It is the highest yielding variety currently not on the market and it has very good winter hardiness, decent protein, medium maturity, and a great disease resistance package. The only knock on it is it has intermediate fusarium head blight resistance, but otherwise it checks all the boxes of being an exciting variety to keep an eye on. So once you've chosen a variety, next is selecting a suitable stubble. When selecting a stubble, it is nice to have something taller with snow catch ability to help insulate the crop. That being said, I would rather have winter wheat seeded the last week of August into a pea stubble than the tail end of the third week of September into canola stubble. As the bigger the crown, the better the winter survival. I think canola is still the best stubble option, but if it is late harvested, such as this year, barley is an excellent alternative. Byringer, Byron Irving's research at Ag Canada in Brandon showed that green feed barley was the second best stubble choice after canola. But make sure that it's two row barley, as two row loses its germ quickly in the fall, so volunteers are not an issue, whereas six row barley maintains its germ and can be a volunteer problem the following spring. Pea stubble can be risky since there is no stubble for snow catch, but if it is harvested early and warms up quickly, it, it is harvested early and warms up quickly the following spring. So if it is seeded early and makes it through the winter, the results that I've seen have been very positive. Other options like oats, flax, and summer follow are available, but not preferred if given the option over canola, barley, or peas. If you're thinking about uh, sowing something into any unseeded acres this fall, variety selection becomes key, as you need something very winter hardy, seeded early to have the best chance of making it through the winter. Lastly, I'd avoid fall rye or wheat stubbles due to volunteers and harboring the wheat curl mite that carries the wheat streak mosaic virus. Seeding date and rate. MASC coverage for winter cereals started this past Monday, August 15th, and runs for about six weeks till September 25th for full coverage and September 30th for extended coverage. My ideal seeding window is between the last week of August and the second or third week of September, but depending on the fall, a later seeding can turn out very well. Wheat seeding rate is old hat to most people, but just a reminder how important it is to know your thousand kernel weights and the varietal differences. We try to target 33 plants per square foot, and depending on variety, that can be nearly an extra 20 pounds per acre. But somewhere between the two to two and a half bushels per acre is good to target. And the later that you are seeding, the heavier you should be seeding to compensate for that. Seed depth. 
in this picture, the winter wheat on the left was seeded at a one inch depth compared to the winter wheat on the right seeded at a two inch depth. The red arrows are pointing at where the seed is. The plant vigor is severely reduced on the right in comparison, and the crown is smaller, giving it less reserves to regrow after the winter. This year it made no difference because the plants were growing into November, but in a year where there is early frosts and snow, the plant on the right likely would not have emerged. I've noticed seed depths of two inches a lot, uh, as in theory, it makes sense to chase moisture, just like spring seeding. Fall seeding is a different game entirely though, and you usually only have September and early October to grow, so you're aiming for fast emergence. The key message is put it in the ground at the first good opportunity, seed shallow, and don't wait for moisture as we usually get some rainy days during harvest or even some really heavy dews that'll help with germination. This is just a visual of what a typical Manitoba spring looks like as we patiently wait to apply fertilizer, either wondering how bad the ruts will be or if it'll rain before the agritain wears off. Uh, fertility is a much discussed and researched topic in winter wheat. The best advice is to get 50% of your nitrogen down in the fall. Our springs are usually either too wet or too dry and rarely in the Goldilocks zone. That makes spring application difficult to either get on the field or difficult to get the nitrogen to the plant roots where it's needed. And early nitrogen is critical to the seed as the seed head is produced by the fifth leaf stage. And that happens around mid-May, so it's hugely important to have nutrition available to the plant in order to develop a big healthy seed head and maximize yield potential. Uh, phosphorus and potassium are especially important nutrients for seedlings and are less available in cold temperatures. A winter cereal makes two seedlings in cold soil, so having plant available phosphorus and potassium is hugely important. And since both P and K are immobile, having some in or near the seed row is definitely necessary. And if you are farming lighter sandy land, make sure to keep an eye on your copper levels. If you see the leaves pigtailing, that is a telltale sign and a micronutrient application may be warranted. Finally, soil tests to find out what is available so that you are not guessing. Saving a little on your fertilizer bill makes a huge difference when fertilizer is so expensive and the chance to catch a deficiency before it happens can stop a train wreck. So switching gears, I'll briefly talk about the other winter cereals, fall rye and winter triticale, which is in the picture on the right. I don't scout these as often, but I still think they're great options and management for both is very similar to winter wheat. Fall rye is split into open pollinated varieties like Hazlitt or hybrid varieties like Serafino or Trebbiano. Open pollinated is more winter hardy than hybrids, but hybrids have a higher yield potential, and I would expect some very high 100 plus bushel per acre yields this year. Winter triticale is a cross between fall rye and winter wheat that is mostly used for forage production. It is about as winter hardy as winter wheat with great feed quality, while having the height and early growth of fall rye for good tonnage or grazing. And all of these winter cereals are starting to become very popular in cover crop mixes as well. Uh, this is a bit of a messy slide, but when talking about winter cereals, I like this because it just shows what plant organs contribute to yield by each crop. As I said earlier, wheat gets most of its yield from the uppermost leaves, the flag leaf and the penultimate leaf. Rye is more from the stalk and the ear, while triticale is mostly from the leaves, but mainly the lower leaves. I think this information is important for showing why flag leaf fungicide timing is very effective in wheat, and as keeping the flag leaf greener will only increase your yields. Uh, fall rye had a, has had a big resurgence recently with hybrid fall ryes being introduced in 2014. They are close to canola in seed cost, but around 30% higher yielding than the conventional varieties like Hazlitt. They are also shorter for less lodging and have a better falling number as well, which makes them very desirable. As you can see in the picture, Hazlitt on the right is quite a few inches taller than the Brissetto hybrid rye beside it. I'm a big fan of hybrid ryes and treat them as a high input crop like canola. And I think that open pollinated rye like Hazlitt has a good fit for a low input, low maintenance crop for seed and straw or feed by grazing silage or green feed. Hazlitt is the go-to open pollinated variety, but there are others like Danko. And then for the newer hybrids, you've got Serafino and Trebbiano look excellent too going forward. And there's still things like Bono or Daniello. Um, all of those are showing great results for yield, falling number, and disease resistance, especially ergot. 
The only major knock on fall rye is the markets seem to have a production ceiling. So if lots is grown, the market can get flooded quickly with lower prices. Although the increase in cover crop popularity is increasing a secondary market, which should hopefully allow acres to increase. So putting it all together, why grow a winter cereal? Well, to make money, of course. The improved water use efficiency helps lead to high yields and having it planted in the fall stops the soil from blowing and reduces the stress of a busy spring. That also keeps a living root in the soil longer, which is big for soil health. The early harvest is also a nice way to test out the combine and iron out any kinks before it's go time. And since they start growing as soon as it's warm, they can outcompete most annual weeds and can reduce herbicide resistance due to this. The tweet is from Charles's crop rotation study, where they found a 75% reduction in kochia densities when winter wheat replaced spring wheat in rotations, especially for a weed like kochia that escapes most burn-off products and has multiple resistances. A cultural control of just being a competitive crop is an excellent option. The table on the bottom left is yesterday's price list for the Gilbert Plains Parish and Heimbecker. Nothing wrong with selling winter wheat at nearly 10.50 off the combine. And new crop off the combine pricing I've heard for next year is already about 11.30 a bushel. Fall rye is also up and I've heard somewhere around 8.50 a bushel. All of these benefits are why most producers who give winter cereals a try usually end up keeping them as a part of the rotation. So just before I wrap up, I wanted to quickly discuss some research we had in the ground at the diversification centers this year. These are pictures from our nitrogen fertility plots, where it's pretty easy to pick out the checks from the high-end treatments. Hopefully this gives some good data for John Hurd, and the Soil Fertility Guide nitrogen recommendation can be updated for newer winter wheat varieties. And lastly, we were also a partner on a spring dormant seeded winter crop trial. And it kind of tried to follow Brian Baer's ultra early seeded spring wheat trial. This one was very interesting as we used spring wheat, winter wheat, winter oats, winter barley, winter peas, and winter lentils in the trial. It was seeded April 8th and all the crops headed out and produced seed. So it was cold enough to vernalize and did not have to survive the entire winter. Still, it had its own challenges as the peas still lied down and the winter wheat and winter barley were slower to mature than the rest. But overall, I think that this was a very interesting trial with promising data from all the cereals and pulses. Lots of potential here to open up a third seeding window in the very early spring for areas that don't get as heavy of snowfalls. And I just wanted to close with a picture of my dog Boots in a winter wheat field from this summer. Thanks for listening and a big thank you to all our partners. Hey, good, uh, thanks Alex. A uh, couple questions uh, come in and uh, I'm just, uh, Trying to get them in, in an order here. Um, um, okay, here's one. How is winter wheat for shelling for harvest with uneven stands? Uh, I haven't really noticed it being too big of an issue. It's usually got really good standability and doesn't kind of shell out like an, an oat would uh, per se. But uh, that being said, I think it's very important to try to harvest it as soon as you can, even in those uneven fields, because it's one of those things where I find a lot of people will say, uh, you could have a number one wheat standing in the field and then you get a half inch of rain and now it's down a grade. So the sooner that you can harvest it and avoid that uh, rainy weather, the better. Okay, a um, couple of weed control and herbicide questions. Um, uh, what's your recommendations for fall weed control? You know, I actually used to say that uh, like frost was probably the best recommendation, but I was looking at some data where they showed that if you let canola volunteers grow to about four inches tall, that the nutrients that they uptook in the fall time wasn't actually available until the following fall. And they took up probably a good like 40 pounds of nitrogen and then other ones as well. So I think that uh, usually you can kind of want to go as cheap as possible, like a Express or um, some kind of like Roundup obviously works too. I just don't like overusing it too much. But yeah, kind of uh, the cheapest option that'll control all the weeds that you're dealing with. And usually for, I'd say 70% of acres, it's volunteer canola. Okay. And uh, I guess the second part of that question was uh, uh, comments on spring weed control. Is it necessary? And I guess you maybe talked about that a bit with the fall rye, but 
on winter wheat, you're probably still seeing most guys spraying, right, for broadleaf weeds? Yeah, I'd say like there's maybe 10% of guys or somewhere around that that actually don't spray or uh, have such a competitive stand that it's kind of, they just outgrow any of those uh, spring annual weeds that pop up. I'd still say that uh, like something like MCPA or a Buctrel M is a very cheap option to control those and you'll probably be happy that you did it if you go ahead and spray. Okay, um, pre-harvest on fall rye, uh, your comments on that? I, uh, I'm i actually always scared of that one because if you leave ruts in the field in fall rye, that can kind of be an avenue to add ergot to more than just your outer rounds or uh, field edges. So I know some guys who've tried to do it by plane. I know other guys that just try and let nature do its thing. And that's usually my preference is if you can just wait as long as possible for it to dry down naturally, then that way you're not spreading further into the field and you're saving a little bit of money on the crop too. Okay, and for marketing it, is it an issue? Uh, like spraying your fall yeah. rye being? Yeah, like, like spraying a glyphosate on fall rye. To my knowledge, I don't think so right now, but I mean, it's one of those things to always, uh, keep an eye on because like about a year ago we could still spray around up on oats and now we can't so I uh, I think that's why you kind of want to get towards doing things where uh, like you're just letting nature do its thing they dry down early anyways and you're already harvesting them early to begin with so waiting that extra four or five days doesn't really make a huge difference in the long run in my opinion okay and then uh, the last question that came in here was uh, regarding falling numbers in Fall rye. Uh, any comments on? Is there any, I guess, any management just things you can do to manage the falling number? Not too much, to my knowledge. I know you're kind of aiming for about, I think, 180 is what they're shooting for. And like in a typical year, your open pollinated varieties are going to be below that, and your hybrids are going to be well above it at like 250. But I actually am not too sure if there's any in crop management that you can do other than just letting like i think a lot of the following number has to do with how wet the year ends up being so it's kind of out of our hands okay and the last one that just came in here what would be your recommendation for silage would you go winter wheat or fall rye that's a an interesting one and i'd probably do the combo and go with winter triticale actually because it kind of combines your your height of your fall rye while getting the uh, protein of your winter wheat so it's a, a really good mixture. And also winter triticale kind of gets that uh, fall rye early season growth where uh, you can look at it and go, that might actually be a decent option to uh, toss the cows on for some spring grazing, or you can put it up in bales or chopped silage. So it, it gives you a lot of flexibility. And yeah, I'd, I'd usually go with winter triticale if given the option, but I have seen good results of the quality that you get out of a winter wheat silage. It's just usually a little bit lacking on the quantity compared to a fall rye. Okay, and I guess my question, you've probably seen a, uh, some combinations uh, with other other um, other crops uh, uh, and winter wheat or, or fall rye or even triticale. Uh, what are some of the other things guys are throwing in with that mix? Or, yeah, the, uh, the big one seems to be hairy vetch. I've seen quite a bit of that. Uh, thrown into a mix and I really like it because it fixes a little bit of nitrogen it binds up the plants so it's still getting lots of sunlight and you usually end up getting like an extra little bit of tonnage as well out of it um, some people caution that uh, hairy vetch is fairly roundup tolerant on its own so it can be difficult to control post your like post harvest of your field but I think that there's uh, lots of other options other than Roundup that you can use to take care of it. I've also seen, like I know uh, James Frey at PCDF this year, he kind of had a trial where he was doing some intercropping with, uh, I think it was red clover, white clover, and alfalfa. And I've seen a lot with red clover. That's probably my favorite of those ones to uh, toss in the mix. It fixes a little bit of nitrogen. It's very low growing, so you hardly really see it be too much of an issue. Um, going forward but it can still get up into your sample if you're silaging it or grazing it and it's fairly short-lived too whereas something like an alfalfa can be a perennial problem if you're not wanting it in the field 
Okay, and uh, maybe just one more thing for me. Uh, uh, DU usually has or has always seemed to have had some programs uh, for first-time growers or, uh, or do you still have any of those things going? <laughs> yeah, I actually, I guess I forgot to give my shameless uh, self-promotion in this presentation. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we do have that program again this year. We're uh, offering new growers. We're kind of in the southwestern region of uh, Manitoba still, but I can work a little bit with outside of that. Uh, we're offering them 20 bucks an acre for every acre that they seed up to a maximum of 250 acres. Plus, you also get a free soil test from Western Ag Solutions and a free year of marketing from uh, FarmLink Marketing Solutions. So it's kind of like a whole package where if you sow 100 acres, you're gonna get about $5,000 in incentives, helping you out with some of the tougher things, which is uh, like the marketing of the crop, what you should be putting down for fertility. And I get to, uh, I try and scout the fields at least every month, if not more frequently. So you'll see a lot of me around in the field too. Okay. Well. Uh... A lot of good information there, Alex. Thanks for uh, coming on and giving us an update on uh, on all of our winter cereal crops. Uh, and uh, I think I've been seeing uh, an increase in some of them, uh, even though we uh, might get a late fall this year. I still think there's a lot of producers interested in in growing some of them. And I'm seeing uh, in, in my travels, anyways, a little bit more fall rye than I normally would see. <clears throat> no, I completely agree. I think that. Almost all of them interest is increasing across the board, and it seems like, uh, especially if we might be heading into another wet cycle, that it would be a excellent option. And you don't have to sow the entire farm down to any of these, but even just having a field or two is nice to kind of dip your toes in the water and get uh, a feel for how it is to grow and see if it's something that's a fit for your farm. Great. Well, thanks again for coming on, and um, if you're going to hang on in case there's some questions before the end here uh we could uh bring you back on yeah for sure thanks for having me there lionel no problem okay so uh what we'll do now is um i'm gonna go through a few slides just uh i guess maybe comment on uh how the crop is doing uh and really not a lot of uh big changes over the past week uh besides maybe some of the harvest has started but uh no, uh, we've been getting some rains. Uh, we're getting uh, really good growing conditions right now. And we're also, uh, uh, you know, in a, in a kind of a cycle here of high humidity and wet mornings, uh, lots of fog. So uh, with that, we all realize that we're gonna be seeing uh, uh, disease uh, showing up and, and spreading very quickly. So it's gonna be interesting to see how we, uh, pan out to, uh, for the rest of the, the growing season here. But uh, uh, right now from our uh, crop, uh, weekly crop report, uh, most of the crop is rated in you know, good to excellent condition. And uh, you know, besides a few areas that maybe we're missing some of the rains this year, but uh, that seems to stay or staying pretty constant right now. Um, when we look at our precipitation and uh, you know, we, uh, we've talked about this all year long, but when you look at uh, our totals so far, you know, pretty much all provinces anywhere from the 220 to 300 millimeters of, of uh, rainfall throughout the growing season so far, which puts us anywhere from, you know, 120 to 150 percent of normal. So uh, definitely helping out the, uh, the areas that were, were uh, dry from last year. And uh, we can see that in our hay production. Uh, talking to producers, uh, we're getting uh, two, in some cases, three times last year's yields. Uh, funny to see too, or I guess it's not funny to see, but uh, also talking to producers saying that they're not able to cut out as many sloughs this year because there's a lot of water in those sloughs. So uh, we're losing a little bit of our slough hay production, but I think uh, we'd give that up for the, the production we're getting on uh, our native and our, our tame hay uh, uh, yields. Uh, our corn heat units, and uh, we've uh, we've uh, caught up fairly good uh, right now. We're anywhere from right on track to where we should be uh, for the majority of uh, of the province. And you can tell that when you uh, are driving and you see uh, uh, take a look at our uh, corn crops. Uh, they're looking amazing right now, uh, and the soybean crop. Uh, they're both uh, growing and and potting and uh, developing cobs and. Uh, uh, right now, I think our biggest uh, 
our biggest thing for both of those crops are going to be our frost-free days uh, throughout to the end of the growing season here and uh, uh, they don't seem to be having a lot of issues with uh, anything else happening with them right now and uh, so uh, definitely helping our uh, longer season or our, our heat loving crops right now they are definitely taking advantages taking advantage of, uh, of the good warm conditions. Uh, a few other things. Uh, this question comes up every year, uh, and uh, Dane put it in our uh, crop report uh, this week, and I thought I'd maybe put it on, on Crop Talk as well. Uh, a lot of times this time of year, producers are looking at second cut, or in some cases, even third cut of their alfalfa, and it comes a critical time uh, in the alfalfa's uh, life stage uh, for uh, it to be able to get it, uh, regrowth after cutting so it can survive winter. And uh, this map uh, kind of gives a really good uh, uh, indication of your area, where you are, and what de date uh, you should be looking at be before you do your last uh, last alfalfa cut. So, you know, most of us are approaching that, that day right now. Uh, some of the provinces are already past that day uh, and, or, and or on today is that day. So uh, again, uh, that's a, it's an important date to keep a long uh, growing stand of alfalfa. Uh, not saying you can't take that second cut. Uh, usually the recommendations is right after killing frost, you could go out there and, and, and take that alfalfa. But uh, for right now, the best would be to let that uh, crop grow, let it establish good, uh, good, root, uh, good root reserves for the winter and, uh, and continue growing. So uh, uh, a good, um, a good map put out, and I guess another good reason to uh, go on a weekly basis to our uh, our weekly crop report and and go through some of the information that's on there. A lot of good data that's uh, showing up on there. A um, couple questions that have come up, uh, and uh, I see we got some of the panel on. I I didn't get a lot of questions this week, but I see that we. Uh, uh, John is on, and uh, John, I'm going to ask you a question regarding, uh, I uh, seen it on uh, Twitter and got actually a text message today, kind of not believing it, but uh, uh, are crickets showing up in numbers that they can, they can do some damage? Normally in field crops, they really don't do a lot of damage, but there are exceptions, and uh, one crop is flax we have noticed in the past that sometimes they will go right up onto the bulls and feed on the flax bulls. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, crickets are omnivores, by the way. We're talking about field crickets, the fall field cricket mainly. They're omnivores. Um, they feed on lots of different types of plant material, uh, even insects, insect eggs, grasshopper eggs are one thing they will feed on. Um, so they're, they're quite om omnivorous. Um, normally in a crop like, say, canola um, or pulse crops, they're feeding more on things on the ground than up on the plants. But again, there's exceptions, so do keep an eye on things. I have seen them climb up on canola plants, but I've never really seen them do economic damage to canola plants. The only field crop I can really say that I've seen them do what might be considered economic feeding would be flax, but uh, some very high levels out there. Uh, but my caution would be, do have a look at what are they doing to the plant, not just that they're there in big numbers in the field. Yeah, good comment. I was just going to say that uh, if they're eating grasshopper eggs, uh, you know, probably there would be bigger numbers where there's grasshoppers as well. Sometimes that's the case. They do seem to have that ability to um, uh, detect and dig for the grasshopper eggs, so that's possible. Okay, good. Uh, thanks, John. And uh, my next uh, question, um, and I wasn't, uh, I got delayed yesterday and wasn't able to get out to the, the fields that I was supposed to, and uh, there's, um, I got a couple of calls regarding, uh, and this is to all the panel, if anybody wants to chime in on this, uh, seeing some uh, uh, spots in the field showing up in wheat fields uh, where it's uh, less than half an acre or maybe as much as an acre, uh, and they're uh, ripening prematurely, uh, not in any specific spots in the field, 
uh, but uh, you'd have a green wheat field and all of a sudden there's two or three spots in that field where uh, there's just basically ripened crops showing up right now. And I was wondering if any of the, the panel might have seen this or, or have seen this or maybe got some calls regarding it. Uh, uh, my apologies for not getting pictures. I would have had them on the, the thing for, our, for you to see today, but I'm definitely going to get them in the next day or so here. So I uh, just wanted to hear if anybody on the panel has uh, heard anything about this. With something like this, it's often a process of, el of elimination. Um, Insect-wise, uh, if it's the, if the plant material is still quite intact but it's turning color, that usually indicates if it is insect-related, uh, something like aphids, a sap feeder. But you would notice the presence of aphids or possibly um, aphid mummies, things like that. Um, there, yeah, sap feeders would be the main potential insect uh, cause of that. They can be patchy at times, but again, you should notice if there was uh, aphids present. You may even see um, re remnants of uh, aphid mummies and things if the population has crashed or moved on. But again, that's just one potential cause would be a sap feeding insect. There's probably plant pathogens, maybe some environmental causes that could be contributing as well. Uh, Lionel, it's John Hurd here. Uh, I, I've been out around in the some wheat and pea and canola fields. I, I haven't seen come across a lot of that, but <clears throat> certainly uh, last year in the drought, uh, the plant really reflected what the subsoil was like. And so uh, I don't know if these are areas where you've had good steady rainfalls, but uh, if you have some premature dying or things like that, sometimes it's a symptom that uh, you've got more sand than clay in the subsoil and, and just starting to uh, uh, dry out and show more drought stress. But again, with the rains, you, you just showed the graph there. It looks like we're quite ample for rain. So again, like John Gablowski said, uh, I, that would probably eliminate that from the, the list of possibilities for 2022. Okay, hey, thanks, John. Um, David, I see you're on. Would you have any ideas uh, when I go out there to look for, for what I should be looking for? Hi, Lionel. I don't think that there are any disease issues you might encounter there. I, uh, if John Heard hadn't chimed in, I would have said something about uh, the possibility of lenses within the field and if you have the detailed soil survey available you can sometimes see uh, the variation in soil across the field and water holding capacity. I've been out disease surveying uh, some of it in wheat and uh, mostly in the northern part of the southwest region and um, yeah there are parts of the fields that that don't look great but it is just uh, small pockets and um, not something I'd be concerned with on the larger scale. Okay. Um, I just uh, okay, uh, got a comment coming in, but yeah, uh, one, one consultant asked me if that would be uh, root rot showing up. Um, what do you think of that, David? Well, if it was something that had started at the beginning of the season because of um, excess moisture in depressional areas, then yes, there might be a root rot there. Um, but generally, uh, common root rot and take all, if they don't occur in patches across a field, they're generally plants here and there, scattered plants. Okay, good. Uh, thanks, guys. Uh, thanks, panel. That was uh, give me something to look for when I go out there. Uh, um, there's been a couple issues show up uh, with uh, some of the canola crops, and I think Dane is on. And instead of me uh, maybe talking about what he sent me, I'm going to see if Dane, if you wanted to make a few comments about what's a good, you know, guys are out scouting their canola fields and maybe what we should be looking for. Hey, Lionel. Um, 
canola fields right now are generally fin anywhere between full bloom kind of finishing up flower to full pod to just starting to be swathed in some cases so we've seen a few fields uh, cut already but as canola turns and ripens unevenly we've seen a lot of unevenness throughout the crop just given the delayed seeding and excessive moisture we've had much of earlier this year those drowned out spots or those previously low spots spots that might have recovered a little bit if they are looking suspect and they are ripening earlier than the rest of the crop or there's something odd uh, and, and the maturity is different in those bathtub ring areas around those low spots, drains, near field approaches, this is the time of year we start finding club root and we start seeing it become more um, visible above ground and not just a below ground symptom. Now we're seeing uh, the tops of plants become weaker, shriveled off, break off sometimes even, and really not uh, ripening and, and hitting their full yield potential. They're ripening up earlier, and we're seeing those brown streaks kind of through a field of canola that might otherwise be green and potted. So stopping your spraying operation, your swapping operation, and getting out of the cab and going into those spots and pulling up plants. And if the and if the plant breaks off at the soil surface, absolutely get a shovel and dig it up because that's a dead giveaway that there's something rotten underneath the ground. And we are finding club root. We found uh, club root in a new municipality this year. So we will be updating our club root maps across Manitoba. Um, warm, moist conditions like we've had this year do favor disease. And club root certainly is coming back after a bit of a hiatus last year in the drought. Other things, other symptoms to note, um, we may see some advanced black leg, some verticillium starting to take hold in our canola fields as they progress towards maturity. Um, obviously, stopping at that uh, swath timing stage and doing some root or pardon me stem cross section analysis looking at the smudge factor on the bottom of the stem for black leg incidents will help you indicate and gauge the severity of black leg in that field and, and it may help you pick a more appropriate variety for the next time canola is grown on that field at least um, two years gap in between a couple things that are ongoing and if anything else comes up obviously give me a shout or, or send your samples into the crop diagnostic lab Hey, and thanks, Dane. Thanks for putting a lot of that stuff in the crop report as well. So, um, okay, so from uh, there, we're gonna a few more slides. I seen this sli uh, advertisement and I thought it'd be good to put up. And uh, for anybody that's got unwanted chemical or old livestock uh, medications and wants to get rid of them, there's uh, Clean Farms is uh, gonna be setting up at several locations. Uh, there's just a, a list of some of them there and the dates that they're going to be there. So if uh, you uh, have some stuff you want to get rid of, uh, definitely a great place to take it and, and, and to get rid of some of the stuff that's just been sitting on shelves or sitting in a shed that uh, doesn't need to be around anymore. Uh, so instead of uh, just disposing of it, take it there and get it uh, disposed properly. So there's the list of locations. I mentioned this last week and I'm not going to go into as much detail, but uh, there's going to be this fall in November, we're going to be uh, having people, a couple of staff go around and, and talk about uh, some of the uh, ways of getting more out of our, our website and our information that we supply. So uh, please keep uh, informed regarding those dates. And as we get closer, I'll definitely have them for you here. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, like always, uh, the uh, Ag adaptation specialists uh, are that's uh, us and our, our locations and our phone numbers. Our uh, livestock uh, uh, specialist and uh, you know and, and also uh, the Manitoba hay listing. I see we're getting uh, lots of people uh, looking at that and wanting to either advertise hay for sale or hay wanted. So uh, definitely, if you've got something for sale or can eating. There's a good place to go to put your information. Our MASC offices and their locations throughout the province and their phone numbers. And I must have missed my last slide, but join us next week uh, for the next edition of Crop Talk. And thanks for the Alex for giving a good uh, uh, presentation on our winter crops. And thanks again for the panel for chiming in and. Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to get pictures of that those wheat fields, so we'll have a more uh, in-depth conversation about that next week. So thanks again for attending.